Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our presentation. Um, if I say us, uh, who are we? Um, we are three former members of uh, Rentschel Essling. We have been part um, of the team since 2018, actually. And now uh, we are gradually ramping out a little bit, more or less. And um, yeah, today um, we are going to present you <clears throat> some different topics about vehicle dynamics. Um, I will present first. Uh, my name is Nils Meinke, and I have been responsible for the suspension as a team leader in the last few years. And I'm going to talk about the tools for vehicle-driven car development, so a little bit the surroundings of it. Um, then the second presenter will be Pascal Balov. He's responsible for vehicle dynamics, and he will talk about tires and force calculation for wishbones and stuff like that. And then third, we have Yannick Bauer, also responsible for vehicle dynamics, and his topic will be lateral load transfer. So yeah, I'm starting with tools for vehicle-driven development. What's that, what does that mean? <clears throat> so that's it's actually not directly vehicle dynamics related, um, but everything else, let's put it like that. What are the tools that we need um, to, uh, to give the vehicle dynamics department the information that we need? and to make sure that um, everything works together in a manner that uh, brings performance to the, to the car in the end. Um, so starting with the design process, the development process of the, of the whole car, um, there are some useful tools that we can employ to support the vehicle dynamics guys and yeah, to, to provide the information so that they can make their simulations and calculations useful for, for, the, for the car. And yeah, most of the tools you probably know, it's CAD, FEA, CFD, DME, DMU is digital mockup um, for collision analysis and stuff. Yeah. Um, of course, we have the vehicle dynamic simulation tools, and but we also can use dynos, dynos of all kinds yeah, for the physical components of the car. The, the first uh, yeah, uh, tools that I mentioned are more digital. Um, but for the car development, obviously, it's also very useful to have uh, dynos for engines, whether it be electrical engines or an internal combustion engine, engine like the mechanical components or electronics. If we uh, do mock-ups um, and test um, PCBs, yeah. So, um, but of course, not everybody has access to all these tools that I mentioned here. So yeah our approach was always yeah make tools of the make use of the tools that you have if you have something at your university and um you don't have other stuff even it's, if it's yeah maybe not the first thing that you would like to have uh, try to make use of what you have because um otherwise uh, you yeah you will not be able to gain any advantage from it and the circum the yeah, circumstances and the infrastructure is different for everybody um, but um, just make sure that you use what you have to, to be um, yeah, as, as efficient as possible here. Um, in general, the vehicle development process should be an iterative process between all the departments that are, that are working on the car. So this is yeah, mainly, or first when you start off uh, building the CAD model, um, it's, yeah, it sh shouldn't be in a way that everybody builds their part. So we have suspension, we have a chassis and somebody build the powertrain, but you should yeah, talk to each other, obviously, yeah, and iterate through it and um, uh, yeah, not come up uh, with one solution, but uh, several solutions and see what works out best um, for everybody on the car and uh, gives the best uh, whole car in the end. Yeah, um, one thing that you should also keep in mind very early are the, the rules, yeah, the regulatory boundaries. You can model them in, in the CAT model or it comes to the aero rule boxes, uh, the chassis templates and stuff, um, yeah, well, rollover protection envelope relevant for um, powertrain components. Um, it's a pr pretty pretty basic thing, but um, pretty powerful because you can see right in the in the concept stage of your of your design if you only have yeah, a main hoop uh, and a frame or a monocoque, um, where can I, can I put my components on the car? and um, how is this affecting the packaging. Um, regarding the rules, you should also uh, have other people check your designs regularly. So 
so that you don't um, do any any heavy mistakes there. Um, so yeah, look at it uh, in in between the team um, for the other departments, but also um, have other people come in, alumni, um, I don't know, guys from the university, and uh, check what what you have done. So um, one tool for early um, vehicle development is also uh, to work with lap time sensitivities. I'm sure you've all heard about lap time simulation. Um, this is one way to get lap time sensitivities, but in, in the ideal world, you would not only do lap time simulation, but also validation. And you can do even the validation uh, yeah, without the simulation, obviously, because if you are not able to set up a simulation, which is not that hard, depending on the complexity on the right hand side, you can see here a MATLAB model. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it comes in all different kinds of complexities. You can start really simple. You can go totally crazy. There's commercial software. Um, but even if you, you're not able to use a simulation, you can still go to the test track and do some really simple tests and then um, use these sensitivities that you got to um, yeah, develop the car. But if you have lap time simulation, then you can extrapolate with a validated model to other tracks that you're not able to build the tracks on a competition and yeah. Um, so it is a tool for concept studies, as I mentioned, and with um, determining maybe only yeah, three major um, parameters, for example, weight, COG height, and uh, aerodynamic drag and downforce, but uh, maybe we can focus on the downforce if you want to. Um, with only determining the sensitivities for these three parameters, we can already um, go ahead and uh, yeah, decide uh, some good, uh, good stuff, um, some interesting decisions. Um, for example, we can yeah, weigh the uh, mass versus COG set position for, for example, the placement of the driver or other components. So this is about uh, saving weight or moving the position. So normally that's mm, something that's pretty hard to compare if you don't have any numbers. So should I move the component down or should I save this and that much weight? What is more effective for the lap time? You can do this. Or um, if you know yeah, the sensitivity for aerodynamic um, downforce, you can use this and define how um, efficient uh, in terms of weight, but also in terms of aerodynamics, a certain component on the car has to be to uh, make the car actually faster and not only look good. Yeah, then um, as I mentioned the, the CAT, the computer aided design as a really useful tool. Um, I think, yeah, most people don't uh, realize actually what, what, what the CAT can, uh, yeah, can do for the, for the development of the car, but it, because it's not only yeah, drawing up stuff and so that you can uh, have a, send a drawing to a manufacturer, but um, yeah, it's actually, I think, your number one tool of, of knowledge transfer. And from the student in the design event, everybody's talking about knowledge transfer because it's obviously a really hard thing to do and from the student with uh, people changing every year. And the, the CAT model is the, yeah, the, hopefully the most uh, accurate um, documentation of your car, um, even if there's no text in it, maybe. Um, so try to think of it in that way and that will hopefully, yeah, um, motivate you to do it more accurate because the goal should be, I think, to have a complete car model without any clashes in the, in the CAD. And the structure of the CAD should reflect the team organization maybe somehow. That's uh, something that you have to ask yourself. Uh, how do I structure the CAD model in terms of the assemblies or products? Um, how many um, levels do I want? Um, yeah. So, there can be links to other software. It's worth about thinking, how do I connect to my FEA? If I'm uh, producing some parts myself, uh, CAMs or computer ed manufacturing, um, everybody's doing the Excel lists for manufacturing and cost report and sponsors, budgeting. So um, it's really worth to sit down at the beginning of the season and uh, see how you can maybe yeah, comprom uh, uh, compromise that and boil it down a little bit so that you have an efficient system that maybe connects all these uh, topics or only some of these, only one or two maybe, um, so that you don't have to uh, work as much um, on the yeah, documentation and uh, Excel side of things. 
Um, yeah, standard process for model structure is important so that the, the models can be reused um, in the years after and people don't have to think um, yeah, too much about how to, how to change the models because if you have a standard structure, then it's easier. Um, you can have shortcuts for standard parts. I mean, like bolts and uh, washers and nuts and repetitive tasks. Macros are a big uh, topic there. Um, yeah, and one other minor thing is uh, yeah, pretty obvious maybe, but look at the CAT model in your team meetings and not only um, let people show some, some slides like I'm doing here right now, it looks really nice here. Oh, we have some great assemblies, but if you don't look closely, you will have some uh, bad um, surprises if you, if you open up and uh, look in detail. Um, what you can do with a, with a really good CAT model or yeah, um, it's easy with a good CAT model and really uh, useful for the simulation of vehicle dynamics um, is the determination of COG and weight and the inertia is really early on in the, in the design stage. Um, if you have a good CAT model, okay, maybe you can just hit one button and it tells you the weight, the inertia and um, the a COG position, then uh, yeah, you can be really happy because I think uh, not uh, most uh, many CAT models are of that good quality, because yeah, you all know CAT is a working working environment where you have also other stuff, um, so you maybe have to use some other solution here, some Excel sheets or other da database where you export only the parts that you want and uh, sum sum up the yeah the the characteristics of the of the parameters. Um, of course, it's only relevant when up to date, and uh, you can validate with scales, tilt test for the COG position, and inertia measurements with a swing. Maybe you've seen that you can find it in the internet for the for the inertias, and then you can measure the real part of the weights and uh, see how good your your models were and where you have to get better. Um, right here we have a little checklist for for FEA, um, which is one tool. If, yeah. To, to examine the stiffnesses of components. Compliance is also um, one topic that yeah, is really relevant for vehicle dynamics. Um, so FEA should not be the final step of your design, but also iterative. You can optimize with the, um, with the yeah, stuff that you find there. Uh, start with a simple model, then advance. Um, so it's hard to debug a model um, that is really big, so start simple, then um, make it more complex and uh, realistic, probably. Um, once you have a simulation, the first thing that you should do is do a plausibility check, I call it. Um, you, you should look at it and uh, have a rough estimate, okay, is this something that I expected or is the model behaving in a way that uh, doesn't make any sense to me? Yeah? Is the deformation deformation realistic? And for simple parts, we can yeah, do a hand calculation with the yeah, most simple formulas for the, for the stresses, for example. Then to be more realistic, you should use uh, nonlinear elements, um, yeah, um, and include other parts for for better realism. Um, so the parts around it um, for uh, better um, load paths, uh, more realistic load paths. Um, you should also pay attention to general mesh quality and uh, refine local areas like hotspots to yeah, really be able to um, see what the, what the stress is and use the internet for debugging. Really easy one, but uh, you have to remember it once you're uh, in, in a stressful situation where you uh, are debugging a model and uh, yeah. So um, then I think, Yannick, it's your turn. At least to go one slide ahead between Pascal. Oh, I think he left the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe you can just go to your slides. And I then can just jump a little forward, forward and I do my thing first. Um, so actually after the tire, but now before, um, we want to talk a little bit about load transfer and the vehicle balances. Um, 
So we don't want to get too deep into complex vehicle dynamic simulation. I think that would also be a bit too much for such a short presentation, but rather uh, about the general understandings of, uh, of the load transfer and the balances. Um, therefore, um, first of all, what kind of balances do you have? I think there are a lot. So the main ones are just pretty simple. The weight balance and the mechanical balance of your car. If you have an aerodynamic car, you also will see uh, have an aerodynamic balance and all of them will influence your overall vehicle behavior. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as just taking the average of the three ones and getting your overall vehicle balance, but there are many, many more um, influences on it. Um, but yeah, as a, as a first approach um, or as an understanding how to be able to influence it, um, it's a good method. But how are the balances defined first of all? So for the weight balance, we just have the weight of the front axle uh, divided by the overall weight. What you should, uh, should consider there is, uh, especially in Formula student, the driver has a significant, significant influence of your weight balance. So always use uh, the balance, including your driver, maybe even uh, different for different drivers. Uh, when designing your car and consider that one and not just the, the pure weight balance of your uh, of your vehicle itself. Then for the mechanical balance, uh, we go with the load transfer of the front axle divided by the overall load transfer. There, um, important to understand is that it's, that it's not just um, uh, depending it on your roll stiffness distribution, but also on other effects. We will have a closer look um, shortly and that um, the anti-roll moment distribution is not necessarily the same than your load transfer distribution. For example, if you have a different track width, then there will be differences in these two uh, numbers. Last, we have the aerodynamic balance. Um, so that's just the downforce of the front axle divided by your overall downforce. If you extract that information from your CFD simulation, um, it's also important to check or to use the distribution in the contact patches of your vehicle, because, for example, if you just yeah look at the contact patches and think of your track of the vehicle going still through the um, the COG position, for example, of your model, then this will influence or induce a pitch moment on your car and therefore inf uh, influence the aero balance. So it's important to to, in, to integrate or yeah, to um, check that influence as well. Um, so now taking a closer look on the mechanical balance or the load transfer. First of all, what is load transfer at all? Um, so it's a dynamic change of uh, wheel load distribution. Um, so we're not looking at overall wheel load changes due to I know, high speeds and euro downforce, for example. It's just the distributions due to longitudinal or lateral acceleration acting on your vehicle. Um, you can also uh, distinguish between the lateral and the longitudinal direction. Um, we want to have a closer look here on the lateral direction uh, and therefore look into that um, beautiful car on the bottom of the, of the page. Um, so you're looking on, on the car from the backside here, having the mass and uh, the vertical forces through the contact patches of both tires and one axle. And now assuming we're doing a cornering situation going to the left. So you're having an acceleration acting on your COG uh, to the left-hand side and a resulting inertia acting towards the other-hand side. To really make your car going around the corner and to support that inertia or to build up this inertia better, um, you're having lateral forces in the contact patches of your tires. Um, and due to the differences in height, you will get a roll moment um, acting on your on your vehicle. To support that roll moment, uh, you will get load transfer and differences in the vertical forces of your um, of your two contact patches of that axle. Um, if you just do the equation, the moment equation, you end up with this formula. And you will see that the um, two things. First of all, uh, the overall wheel load uh, is staying the same. So uh, that's important to understand. And the second one is that the load transfer, uh, the overall load transfer of your vehicle 
is independent on the load transfer distribution. So if you stiffen up, for example, the ARB on one axle, you will change the load transfer distribution, but you won't change the overall load transfer of the vehicle. For sure, that's just roughly uh, small uh, approximations done there because you will have, due to the movement, some changes in your COG position, your contact patch, your effective track with all that stuff. But if you assume a stiff system, then uh, the two um, points are true. So um, now to uh, understand the load transfer distribution a bit better, we're going to the side view of uh, that vehicle and having our body up there with the sprung mass um, beneath our two wheel assemblies connected by your roll springs, front and rear, and the two tires uh, connecting it to the road. So basically pretty simple double oscillators. You don't need to consider any dampers in that point because we're just looking at the steady state situation. So there won't be any influence by the dampers. Um, if you now go into the cornering situation again uh, and the row moment, these springs will be compressed due to the row to support of the, of the row moment and your load transfer distribution is just dependent of the on the stiffness distribution of these uh, springs in a row. But unfortunately, it's not as easy as shown in here. Um, so you also have different effects. Um, first of all, we want to look at the um, geometrical transfer of your sprung mass. Therefore, we're jumping back to the rear view of our vehicle again. And now I just put in the uh, wishbones. As you can see here, we have to double wishbone axle let's say, and if you um, draw the lines of these uh, wishbones longer, they will intersect at some point, um, which is yeah called the instantaneous center of rotation. Um, you're done for both sides. You also get the height of the center and the distance y between the center and the middle of your contact patch point. Um, now you can connect these centers to the contact patch point again and we'll get another intersection which is called the road center of that axle and um, is at least in without any road angle should be in the middle of your car um, to, to compute the geometrical transfer of your sprung mass there are different approaches or different methods to do that um, many using the CO, the road center height um, that's working if you have if it's in the middle of the car and you won't have any roll angle. But if you assume going around the corner, um, you can imagine that these instantaneous centers uh, will move and they won't move the same way on the right and the left hand side. So therefore, also um, your roll center most likely won't be in the middle plane of your car anymore. And to be more accurate, that's why I'm using uh, this height of your instantaneous center instead of the road center height to calculate the suspended mass geometrical transfer. Um, now, we already have in our lateral forces um, through the contact patch. And uh, as you see and see, we will get a moment around this center, instantaneous center of rotation. Um, and this is supported by a vertical force change on through the contact patch. So um, pretty simple, we do the equation again, end up by this formula and can also do uh, the same thing for the other side. Um, the formula is the same, but as you can see here, even if the, both centers are at the same position, you have different lateral forces due to different uh, wheel loads on both tires uh, or yeah, both tires on one axle due to the load transfer already existing. That's why, as you can see here, also uh, the delta, uh, no, yeah, the delta I've set on both sides is not the same in that case, um, and the difference are called also yeah, checking forces acting on your body, and therefore lifting or reducing the height of your body depending on your uh, height or the yeah, on the kinematics. Um, if you look at the formula, you can see if I now move that point down to the uh, height of the ground, you won't have any geometrical transfer of your sprung mass. If it's above, you have a positive one. If it's below, you will have a negative transfer. 
these uh, computations just can be done uh, not for both sides of one axle, but also need to be done for both axles. And with that calculated, we can jump back to our side view of our vehicle and um, put in these forces as a support of your sprung mass. So regardless of the deflection of your road spring, you will have the support of your sprung mass additionally, uh, and that's influencing your load transfer distribution. But still, uh, we are not having everything. Um, as you can see, we also have these unsprung masses down here, and they are not just connected as shown here by the springs, but also by your wishbones to the body. And that's why um, they are partly, depending on your kinematics, but uh, this will be a combination between geometric and elastic transfer. Um, to explain that, we will once again jump back to the rear view of our car. You already know that picture. And now I've just put in the mass of your uh, unsprung, uh, unsprung mass. Um, as a height for that or CO2 height of your unsprung mass, I'm just using uh, the radius of your tire to make it a bit more clear for sure. That's not necessarily the case that it's in the middle of your wheel. Um, you can also use the exact position um, to, to compute uh, or use that for the computation. But yeah, like I said, to make it easier, I'm now using um, the rolling radius here. Um, if I now uh, look at the lateral acceleration, you will also get an inertia acting on your uh, on your unsprung mass, and this will be supported by uh, by also a change of vertical load through the contact patch again. So we can just do the calculation again and see uh, this kind of this factor the difference between these two heights. Um, so with that formula, you can see if I'm now putting in the instantaneous center of rotation, just in the middle of the axis, you won't have any geometrical transfer of your unsprung masses. So everything will be transferred elastically. Um, so there, there's a difference to, to the sprung mass. Uh, again, we do that for both sides, uh, sorry, both sides and also for both axles. And with that information, we one last time jump back to the side view of our vehicle and try to enter it there. Now, like I already said, what we just done is uh, the calculation of the geometrical transfer of your um, unsprung masses. So that means that that amount going through the wishbones, all the rest is transferred elastically. Uh, so that's supported by your body. That's why uh, I've put the whole mass of the vehicle up here now, removed it from there. And can, now we can put in just the, um, the forces we calculate. Now the geometrical support, again, as support of your whole vehicle mass, acting directly on, on your tire, actually. So then you can say your overall vehicle um, mass is supported by your road springs, by the geometrical effect uh, for your sprung mass, and by the geometrical effect of your unsprung masses. And all of them have in row your tire stiffness, um, which yeah, also pretty much influence um, your load transfer distribution. Okay, um, so I think that's already quite most of, of the steps done here. For sure, there's still a lot of other effects influencing your load transfer and the distribution, for example, if you assume you're going through a low speed corner with quite high steering angles and having some anti-dive on your front axle, um, your pure or your lateral force of the tire is not purely acting lateral on your vehicle anymore, but also you will get a longitudinal component there. That's why uh, you can also see uh, load transfer influences due to um, the, the anti-dive pretty much the same as done for the road center. And also if you have a kingpin angle, you will get a vertical uh, movement of your front wheels due to your steering angle. And for example, as another to name another effect, your tire stiffness down here is not just, or the deflection is not just dependent purely on your vertical force, but also the tire is somehow moving away under lateral uh, force and that's influencing your tire stiffness. 
All right. With that, I would jump back to Pascal's part. Uh, All right. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Okay. So yeah, then hello. Uh, also from my side. Um, yeah, I'm now gonna talk a little bit about the tires um, because no, maybe Yannick, you need to switch to the next page. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, you know uh, exactly the tires um yeah the tires are the, the most important parts of a vehicle um, in terms of vehicle dynamics um because yeah as you can imagine there are like four four contact patches of the tire which are basically the size <laughs> have to have the size of your hands and these four contact patches are the only the only areas uh, where where the car is, yeah, does have a contact to to the ground, and yeah, here in the on the left side on the picture, you can see a top view of of a tire, and uh, the the gray area uh, is is the contact patch here, so the area where the tire is touching the ground. Um, and now if if the driver um, is driving and then uh, steers a little bit. The tire is not rolling freely in a straight line anymore. Um, but now, if the, if the driver steers, um, the tire slides with an angle over the street, um, and this angle is called called a slip angle. And now, with this slip angle, um, you can imagine that um, on the yeah, the more you go to the rear of the, the, the contact patch, um, there will be a shear stress um, on the contact patch um, due to the slip angle. And this shear stress um, then induces the lateral force of the tire. So yeah, this is how, how we get the, the, the force from the tire. And now if we increase more and more the slip angle, the shear stress will, will rise and so will the lateral force. And this can be seen here in a typical tire diagram where we see the lateral force over the slip angle. So in the, in the first few degrees of, of slip angle, uh, the, the tire will, uh, the lateral force will increase um, linear. And then yeah, with more, more slip angle, slowly in the back of the uh, contact patch, um, the, the static friction will go over into a sliding friction. And therefore, we will some yeah will lose basically um, lateral force, and this is why we see yeah this this maximum here of the lateral force at a given slip angle. Um, yeah, and then if we increase the slip angle even more, uh, the lateral force will decrease. Um, also, um, yeah, as already mentioned the. The shear stress will increase uh, from the front to the rear of the contact patch. So, and therefore, uh, the lateral force behind the middle point of the uh, contact patch is bigger than in the front. Um, and therefore, the force is not acting in the middle point, um, it's acting a little bit behind. Um, and therefore, we will get an aligning torque of the tire. So, at a moment around the Z axis of the tire. Um, and that's why we see this aligning torque curve here. Um, yeah, this will increase with more lateral force. But then, as already mentioned, as the, the static friction goes over into sliding friction at the rear of the tire, uh, the lever arm, so basically the yeah the lever arm of the force uh, will decrease. Um, this lever arm is is called pneumatic trail. And yeah, this will decrease, and therefore we will see this maximum of the aligning torque here. Yeah. Um, now, 
if we yeah, know this, this typical tire, tire diagram of the lateral force, uh, what we now can do is, is compare different tires, or diff not even not only different tires, but also different tire curves. Um, yeah, and for this, we can have a look at uh, different areas of this tire curve. And the first is, is uh, in the area with, with small slip angles, um, where the force increases uh, linear, this uh, stiffness, uh, sorry, this, uh, this part is called uh, the lateral tire stiffness. Um, and yeah, as we can see here, the, the tire B, the red one, um, has quite a high lateral tire stiffness, um, which means at a slow, uh, small slip angle, the lateral force is already quite high. Um, yeah, this also can be feel by the, by the driver that uh, the, the vehicle or the tire is very direct and agile. Um, and this tire also has the highest maximum. So this means this tire can achieve the maximum, uh, the, the, the most lateral force compared to the other two. But after the peak, um, it decreases quite a lot. So which means this tire will be very hard to drive because um, if you don't match or don't hit exactly this maximum here, um, then you will lose lateral force again. Um, and to, to get those diagrams uh, for, for tif uh, different Formula Student tires, um, some of you maybe heard of it, um, but there, there's this uh, FSIA Tire Test Consortium. And what they did is basically, yeah, they, had, they tested all, all available Formula Student tires. Um, yeah, you need to pay some, some fees, but then you yeah, have access to all of the Formula Student tires. Uh, to the data of them, and uh, this is quite useful um, to design your vehicle. Um, no. um, exactly. Now, um, what we can do now with, with this tire diagrams um, is, for example, to determine the optimum camber. Um, yeah, here in this picture, you can see a vehicle with, with a static camber. And as you can imagine, if the tire has a static camber angle, so this just due to this his cylindrical uh, form, um, he wants to move in a in a circular uh, direction. Um, therefore, it already induces a lateral tire force. Um, of course, uh, if you have the same camber angle left and right, um, uh, there will be not the, the vehicle will uh, still be driving in a straight line because you have this force right and left. But this force uh, can already seen in the in the tire diagram. Here we have three different diagrams of uh, three tires uh, of one tire with three different camber angles. And with a static uh, camber angle, we already see a lateral force at zero degree of slip angle. Um, exactly, and now uh, under, under lateral, lateral force of the tire, um, here we have a picture of, of a tire dyno where we can see a tire under lateral force. <clears throat> and as you can see here in the left side, of the contact patch, the tire yeah, somehow loses the contact. And um, yeah, therefore, not so much uh, lateral force is achievable. Um, yeah, as we also can see here in these pictures um, with more negative camber, the contact patch will be bigger and therefore more lateral force uh, can be achieved. Of course, if you have too much camber, um, the contact patch will be smaller again. Um, yeah, but uh, this can then be seen here also in the tire diagrams. Um, here in this example for this tire, um, the maximum lateral force can be achieved with two degree of camber. And yeah, the, the four degrees is all already too much. So we are losing a little bit of potential. 
and yeah, what we can do now with this information um, when designing our vehicle. Now, yeah, um, yeah, here I made some some example uh, calculation. Um, because yeah, what what we see here in this picture, we want a uh, uh, camber uh, to achieve the let maximum lateral force of two degree. And now, uh, for for an example corner, we can calculate um, our camber at the wheel. And yeah, for this, we take the static camber. So that's our setup camber, which we have when the car is standing still. Um, of, for example, 1.5 degree. And then when we drive through the corner, um, our vehicle will have a given roll angle. Um, here in this example, one degree. So we will basically lose one degree of camber. But then with our kinematic design, uh, we can basically gain a little bit of camber back um, here, 70%. So we will gain 0.7 uh, degree of camber. Also on the front axle, we can gain camber with steering. So we can design our kinematics that we gain camber uh, when we steer. So here, 1.3 degree of camber. And then, yeah, we will lose something to the, the compliance. So the deflection of all the parts of the rims of the wishbones. And yeah, in this example, we'll lose uh, 0.5 degrees. And yeah, if we sum up all these uh, losses and gains, uh, we will come up with two degree of camber, which was our target here. <clears throat> so now um, another example where tire data uh, can be quite useful. Um, is the Ackermann uh, design. Um, yeah, as, as you can see here in the picture, um, if a car turns around a corner, um, the steering wheel angle to yeah, get the, the, the optimum steering wheel angle um, can be determined um, with the wheelbase. Uh, and the, the corner radius. So in the, in, the inside wheel always have to steer a little bit more than the outside to, yeah, to, to get the optimum steering wheel angle if the car is rolling freely. But now um, if we have a race car and have, uh, have high lateral forces, um, yeah, this, this optimum Ackermann angle will change a little bit. And that's what we can calculate uh, out of the tire diagram. Um, here I made an example calculation for, for this corner here, 50 kph, 10.5 meter radius. And yeah, as already mentioned, the theoretical optimum Ackermann uh, steering wheel angle for the wheels um, without any slip angles uh, can be determined with the wheelbase divided by the corner radius. And now, yeah, if we have here this corner radius with 10.5 meters, then the inside wheel and the outside wheel obviously have, have different corner radius. And with this formula, we then can calculate the optimum Ackermann angle here in this example, 9.3 and 8.3, um, which means then that uh, the wheel angle difference between right and left um, for 100% of Ackermann is one degree. But now if we have a look at the tire diagram um, with the uh, load transfer, what Yannick already mentioned, uh, we then can go into this tire diagram. You will see there are three different diagrams for different wheel loads. And if we now know um, our wheel loads that are outside and the inside wheel, um, we can determine the optimum slip angle to achieve the maximum tire force, the maximum lateral force. Because yeah, this is dependent on the tire, but here in this example, um, on this tire with more wheel load, um, the optimum slip angle to achieve the maximum lateral force increases. And therefore, for these wheel loads here in this example, 
um, for the outer wheel, the optimum slip angle is 6.7 and for the inner 5.8. And yeah, now, of course, we um, to, to get this corner, um, the driver has to steer also, yeah, basically the slip angle plus the, the Ackerman wheel angle. And now if you want to determine the optimum angle for both front tires, um, we basically have to calculate the difference between the optimum 100% Ackermann wheel angle to the difference of the optimum slip angles. And in this example, this would be a 0 0.1 degree then. And yeah, if we now divide the 0 0.1 divided through this 1% of 100% Ackermann, um, yeah, then we come up with 10%. Uh, of Ackermann, which would be ideal for this corner. Of course, this will change for, for every corner. And also if we already apply a static uh, toe angle, this will also change. But yeah, this uh, can be done then for different corners and then yeah, included in this design phase um, to determine the, the Ackermann value for your kinematics. So now one more a small example, uh, which we can what we can get of, out of the tire data um, is the the optimum tire pressure. Um, yeah, here a little picture, which which might be quite obvious, but um, yeah, if if we have too much pressure in the tire, and um, the contact patch will all only be be in the middle of the tire and if the pressure is too low the, the contact patch will be quite high for have quite high forces on the outside and not on the inside and therefore if we not have the optimum tire pressure um, the achievable lateral force will be not um, the maximum and yeah this can be seen in tire diagrams as well if we see tire diagrams of different uh, pressures here in this example uh, 0 0.7 bar is the, the optimum, but of course this changes with every tire. And of course this uh, yeah has, has some more influences the optimum pressure, not only for the lateral force, but also for the longitudinal force. So in the end it has to determine on the track, but to give a first rough estimation, uh, the tire data is quite useful. So... Uh, do we have the time for this, Yannick? Yeah, I don't have many much left. Just go on. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, if we now go a little bit away from the tires, um, more to the to the kinematics. Um, here we'll, we'll present you a little bit about a little tool which we designed in MATLAB. It's quite easy, but uh, quite quite useful. Um, to determine the forces of all the wishbones of uh, all the four wheels, um, which you then can use for, uh, for, for example, for the uh, FEA simulations uh, Niels talked earlier about. And yeah, for this, um, we have different input parameters um, of the mass, of the COG height, the waist distribution, um, and also the road, distribution, road stiffness distribution. And yeah, then we import all our kinematic points here. So of all the wishbones, the push rod uh, and the, the track rod. And also we define uh, different uh, load cases here. Um, yeah, typical load cases like braking, corner entry, corner steady state, corner exit with different accelerations of the vehicle at, at uh, different speeds, of course. Um, yeah, these, these load cases can be determined by measured data or also estimated uh, with simulation. And out of these load cases, we can calculate um, as a first step the four tire forces. So, yeah, as, as Yannick, for example, I already mentioned, at different lateral accelerations, we then cal can calculate the different V loads. 
and and so on. Also, the aerodynamic downforce um, can be included, and also uh, the aerodynamic drag should not be forgotten. And yeah, then we have the uh, tire forces at all four wheels, and with these four tire forces, we then uh, can can build this equation here, um, where we have. Right here. Um, the, the three tire forces of each wheel and also the three tire moments around the wheel. Um, here we have um, the normalized directional vectors of the wishbones. So of all the six wishbones or four wishbones, push rod and drag rod. And also um, the lever arms of these wishbones uh, around the wheel center. And if we now let MATLAB solve this equation. Um, then we can calculate the wishbone forces um, and the push rod and the drag rod forces, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then maybe Yannick, yeah. do you want to do the last slide? Mm -hmm. Um, so um, now drawing back the line between uh, our lower transfer topic and the tires, um, you can see here a lateral curve of uh, a lateral force of a tire over the wheel load, um, as Pascal already showed a little bit. Um, that's a depressive curve since the friction coefficient of the tire is decreasing over the wheel load. So if you assume we have two tires of one axle um, at the beginning with the same wheel load, let's say they're having 4,500 Newton of wheel load, um, we can see that the lateral force uh, each wheel can transfer is about 5,700 Newton. Now I was talking about load transfer, so we do cornering. Uh, load distribution of the axle is not staying the same with higher loads on the outside, lower one on the inside. Um, so let's say our outer wheel is now 7,500 Newton and the inner one 1,500. So the overall load stays the same of the axle, but just the distribution changes. If we now want to uh, calculate the mean uh, value of the lateral force, uh, each tire can transfer. We can just draw a line between this point and this point. And for the mean value of the vertical force, draw, draw again a horizontal line like that. And now we can see that um, in the mean or as an average, each tire can only transfer less than 5,000 Newton of lateral force anymore, even though the overall load and the axis is staying the same. So um, as you can see here, this is yeah, the effect where, um, how your load transfer can influence the balance. Since for example, if you stiffen up the uh, ARB at the rear axle, uh, then you're getting more load transfer on that axle. Like I said previously, the overall load transfer won't change. So you're decreasing the load transfer at the same time in the front. Uh, with that, you increase the lateral force potential in the front axle and decrease the lateral force potential at the rear axle and so influence the balance and the behavior of your car. Okay, um, so with that said, we're at the end of our uh, presentation. We want to thank you for your attention. Sorry for the technical difficulties we had and um, would now be ready for your questions. Uh, hello guys. Uh, my name is Vladimir. I'm from Toyota Racing Team from Toyota. Uh, and uh, my question is uh, why does your team use uh, 13-inch wheels? 
Um, so to answer the question, the the idea or yeah the so the decision was not just done by saying okay we want to use thirteen inch rims, but basically uh, based on the on the tire decision. So we were analyzing different tires. In our case, we have uh, the ability to do in-house tire testing on a measure of our dyno of the university, and also did comparisons on previous years' cars with different tires, and then decided to um, see higher potential, or yeah, the Goodyear tire is a better one. And for sure, you also have um, some arguments um, between a 10 and 13 inch rim, but the main uh, argument was really the tire, and that's why we were going with that. Uh, you mean uh, you compare uh, 10 inch wheels and uh, 13 inch wheels in different conditions? Yeah. So we were not only comparing 13 inch rims, uh, wheels, but also 10 and 13 months. Um, on track on on the dyno, and then uh, said that overall for us the the 13 inch or the good years in the specification has the higher potential. Uh, okay, but uh, 10 inch wheels uh, uh, provide uh, for your car a lower uh, center of uh, 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 center of gravity, uh, lower unsprung mass, lower acceleration time, uh, lower um, uh, um, moments of inertia and uh, uh, it's uh, lower uh, mass, mass of uh, suspension components. Uh, for sure, that's right. Um... Like I said, we what we not we just um, we not only compare the tires on a dyno where you don't see these effects, um, where you just see the pure forces and all that stuff, but we also did the comparisons on uh, on the real car. So there you can include uh, having this additional weight, having this additional inertia, all that stuff, um, and. You can also, um, for example, what you can do is just uh, if you wanted to compare such or different rim sizes as well, you can use the tired uh, data on the one hand side. And if you have a lap time simulation or some sensitivities Niels was talking about previously, you can use that and say, okay, I'm having, for example, with that 13 inch tire, a higher amount of lateral force or higher friction coefficient. I know maybe you have a tire model or whatever. And um, then also add in your model this additional weight, this additional inertia, um, and all that stuff, and see what the lap time is doing. But for sure, you also have differences in, in the temperature behavior of the uh, and all that stuff. So it's a pretty complex decision for sure. Um, but yeah, like I said, um, we did different comparisons and um, put on the end the list with, with all the advantages and advantages for certain tire including its its rim size and for us in the end um we, we went with the 13 inch uh, good year okay thank you uh, and uh, uh, you uh, your team uh, use uh, uh, tires can uh, tires continue tolls uh, 13 inch yes so we so using 13 inch good year tires. What else? Uh continental tires. Uh no, we're using good year. Uh, ah, okay, okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Vlad. I represent North Capital Motorsports of uh, St. Pete Polytechnical University. And uh, I want to ask you, 
do you use uh, any additional software alongside your handwritten program for calculations of uh, forces? And if you do, which ones do you use? Um, for, for the force calculation, we are mainly using the self-developed tool. Um, we were also using um, some FEA simulation tool uh, for the whole vehicle simulation, um, for, for the kind of overall vehicle compliance simulation, um, where we just put in the, the forces in the contact point and then using um, yeah, an inertia relief technique uh, to, to apply the accelerations on different mass points of the vehicle and um, also got some or can extract the forces from there but um, it's yeah, way more effort to, to compare different um, kinematic um, yeah, approaches so that's why we're mainly using the self-developed MATLAB tool for, uh, for the force calculation. Yeah, thank you. And you said you are using software for compliant measurements. Uh, and do you do you also have test bench for validation of such calculations? Um, yeah. So what we normally do is like um, I think a lot of teams do that. It's just a torsional stiffness test of the whole vehicle, uh, where you can do a convalidation on that. Um, but we're also doing um, yeah, stiffness tests on uh, local chassis pickup points um, with a self, yeah, pretty simple tools, kind of a self that for us, um, because yeah, we don't have any KNC um, uh, dyno we can use, but trying to do uh, yeah, a lot of measurements on, on the possibilities we have. Mm, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, guys, so there's a question from my side. Uh, I saw uh, the pictures that uh, your car on the seven post trick. Uh, can you explain a little bit uh, how you use it, uh, why uh, you need it, and um, let's say, uh, uh, did you reach a really significant uh, performance improvement compared to the uh, time and uh, cost of uh, using this equipment? I mean, I mean, probably you have this in your, into your university, but uh, it is worse uh, for the teams who have uh, no their own seven post trick to trying to find uh, uh, anywhere it uh, and trying to use it. Um, so first of all, unfortunately, we don't have a seven post at our university. Would have been cool, but um, we don't have okay. that there. So we went to kind of a sponsor to do that. Um, we, what we did there, first of all, uh, did testing on a four post to, to come up with some, some basic spring and damper setup, um, where we mainly were focusing on contact patch load variations. Um, and afterwards uh, went to the seven post um, for track replay. Um, the reason why we kind of need it is uh, compared to at least to a four post, if is oh, is due to the high downforce uh, these cars generating, so it's playing quite a significant role in your spring and damper setup. Um, and then you can not just optimize on on contact patch rate variation, but also on uh, chassis or yeah, body um, platform stabilization. So um, with your aerodynamic sensitivities of the car, you can um, you can see what kind of uh, body movement you maybe want to avoid uh, when you're hitting a ground or whatever at which angles and um, yeah improve the setup like I said not only on contact patch load variation what you can do on a four post but all on, on other aspects 
Okay, thank you. Еще вопросы какие-то есть? Нету? Okay, it seems like no more questions so far. Uh, and um, yeah, I want to say a big thank you to you guys. Uh, it was interesting. It was uh, nice to see all of you again after the judging in uh, Germany. <laughs> okay, and um, yeah, uh, now we have here a lunch break. And uh, yeah, thank you again. And I wish you good luck into the further seasons. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao. Bye bye.